direction <laughs> in my excitement to uh, share the word of God last week. I made the statement about the Euphrates passing through Egypt. Of course, that's not correct. Most of you probably already knew that. Thank you for not calling me out. Uh, that would be the Nile. Uh, but uh, if you'll recall, back before we started our discussion of Revelation, we, we discussed uh, three significant rivers and their uh, possible roles or their actual roles in prophecy and the Euphrates and the Nile were, were two of those. The Nile does have its, have its issues as well as the Euphrates. But I just wanted to clear that up. So uh, the Nile is the one that actually passes through Egypt. Well, well what, what three rivers are significant? Uh, the Nile and the Euphrates. The Euphrates. E the Nile, the Euphrates, and the one we discussed some weeks back uh, would have actually been the Colorado. Uh, in the, these were all in reference to the fact that the three of them are going dry and their significant roles to agriculture and, and, right. and, and things of this nature. Uh, the Euphrates and the Nile, both being in, in the Bible, specifically named. What was the third one? Colorado. The Colorado. What in the United States? Mm -hmm. it, it plays a huge role to uh, fresh water supply, supplying a number of major western reservoirs, and to uh, so drinking water would be impacted, uh, agricultural use is impacted, and, and it's in severe drought out there. So that, that was in our discussion weeks ago. And I wanted to clear that up on the Euphrates. I got a little excited and said it runs through Egypt. And, and that's actually the Nile. But both of them have got their issues. Uh, we were discussing last week Ezekiel 38 and 39 as uh, one of the events that takes place between Revelation chapter 3 and chapter 4. And we covered uh, the first 13 verses of 38 as far as who is coming to invade Israel and uh, what their motivation could be or most likely is that we see today uh, based on what the scripture is telling us, how today's events are lining up with what the scripture says, that they're coming to take plunder, they're coming after wealth and resources, and we discussed how we see the events of today lining up for that. We, uh, we discussed also uh, a little bit of the alignments that we see where the nations that are to be involved in this are starting to uh, get friendly, form uh, coalitions, form treaties, uh, such as Turkey and uh, Russia getting real chummy. Uh, such as uh, Russia being in Syria now, uh, some of these other alignments that are taking place to make this possible. Never before in history has such an event been possible, and we see it lining up now. Uh, let's pick up with verse 13 of chapter 38 and continue to look at what's taking place. And we will go into 39. Uh, we'll probably stop with verse 16 and 39. That'll, that'll paint the picture. So these uh, nations are coming. They're coming to invade Israel. And the scripture says, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold? to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. 
You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you, I will give you the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field nor cut down any from the forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give God a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers because there they will bury Gog and all his multitude. Therefore they will call it the Valley of Hamon Gog, which literally means uh, the multitude of God. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying them, and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when anyone sees a man's bone, he will set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamongog. The name of the city will also be Hamana. Thus they shall cleanse 
the land. And we'll stop right there. That paints uh, the picture of what's taking place going on. We would read about the, the triumph of festival, uh, the birds of, of prey, and the, the creatures of the land feeding on the fallen army. And uh, we would go on to read about Israel uh, being um, blessed by the Lord because of this and them knowing his name. Uh, but that plays right into the, the other statements that are being made here. Uh, in verse 13, when it says, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish are going to say, are you coming to take a plunder? As I mentioned last week, uh, that's the motivation for this confederacy, this massive army coming against Israel. They're coming after wealth, they're coming after resources. And I explained to you how we can see this lining up through the the damage that's been to the global supply chain through COVID, through the damage that's been done to the supply chain, chain through the war between Russia and Ukraine, and the, the issues with uh, uh, being, the agricultural areas of the world being impacted, and, and particularly Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I explained to you about the, the natural gas situation, how uh, when we reduced our production and export uh, after the Biden administration took effect, and then it was further hampered uh, by the war between Russia and Ukraine, and then Russia began to use it as a, um, a war tactic uh, by manipulating their supply of natural gas uh, before those pipelines were actually destroyed uh, in, in, in resistance to the sanctions that were being placed on them. So you see this perfect storm, all these things aligning to create a reason why they would need to come against Israel. Of course, Israel is, is hugely blessed in, in minerals, in elements used for all sorts of production. It's blessed in precious metals. It's vastly blessed with oil and natural gas. Uh, it would be a place that people would want to come to to uh, get the things that they need and want. Even, uh, as I have mentioned previously, these rivers drying up and these areas that are seeing drought. Israel is, has uh, uh, excellent systems for actually taking water from the sea, desalinating it so that it can be used as drinking water. So even water could be a motivation for these nations to come against Israel. So we see this perfect storm. Now the, the, these nations, Sheba and Dedan, they refer to peoples uh, which populated that portion of the world, a vast number of them actually in what we know today as Saudi Arabia. Of course, Saudi Arabia, um, they uh, will not be one of the nations that we see coming against Israel. Um, they are looking to try and basically have good relations with everybody so they can continue to export their oil. Uh, now the merchants of Tarshish, there have been different places known in history as Tarshish. There's even a city now in the Middle East that is called by Tarshish. But this reference is more about the merchants of Tarshish. Uh, Tarshish being used uh, as a reference, and you see this later in the book of Revelation when it talks about the ships of Tarshish uh, being great ocean-going vessels, uh, exporting goods, importing goods. It's really about a nation or nations that are doing world trade, that have uh, a great deal of trade with other nations, particularly over the seas. So in the case of the merchants of Tarshish, we're not really referring to a specific place in that case, but to any nations that may be uh, engaging in that type of uh, economic activity. And uh, therefore, it could even be a reference to a nation such as the United Kingdom, which didn't exist at that time, but a nation that's known for uh, its uh, imports and exports at one time had the mightiest navy in the world. They, they do trade by sea. Uh, and because it makes this reference and all their young lions, that would suggest that there are offspring.
offspring from these nations, these great trade nations. When you look at much of the uh, um, current modern world, you find that at some point or another, there were colonies in these places from these mighty uh, nations, these mighty ocean-going nations. The United States of America being one that, that comes to mind. Uh, being a young lion, a descendant of the United Kingdom, which in effect actually uses a, a lion as one of its symbols. Uh, so here you have mighty nations, economic powers of the world. Uh, some of them would undoubtedly be, have to be uh, military powers in order to defend their ability to uh, trade freely throughout the world. And they're doing nothing more than questioning the confederacy that's coming against Israel. So one might ask, well, if the United States is one of the greatest empires ever in human history, if we have the greatest or one of the greatest militaries now in, in the world, uh, if we are indeed a young lion descended from the lion of the United Kingdom, um, if we have a history of friendship with Israel, uh, efforts to help Israel defend itself, why in this time would the United States not take an active role against this invasion uh, by, by Russia and, uh, and these <coughs> other Eastern European nations and, and, and these Islamic nations? That's something that uh, going forward, we'll, we'll study in a little more detail another time. But I propose to you that the United States does not take an active role in this situation, as one might expect, for a, a number of possible reasons. One could be the United States has ceased to exist. I think this one's somewhat unlikely. Um, I do not see the United States ceasing to exist without a direct act from God himself. Otherwise, if it did cease to exist and it was by the hand of man, it would require something like nuclear warfare, in which case one of the other nations with the potential to do that would also have ceased to exist. If it were from the hand of Russia, well, our uh, military uh, defense uh, philosophy is that uh, if you're going to take us out, we're going to take you out too. So that would also eliminate China. Uh, while North Korea uh, could do a, a great deal of harm in the United States with nuclear weapons, uh, they do not have the ability to completely destroy the United States. Now, what can happen is that the United States may cease through some military action to be a major player on the world stage. That's quite possible. Uh, in the United States, we have a, an electric grid that has some 55,000 substations. Can you take out less than 20 to shut down the entire electric grid in the United States? If the war were to escalate with Russia and Ukraine, Russia already saying that, that the United States and NATO is fighting a proxy war against them through Ukraine, uh, if we were to uh, enter into some sort of direct conflict uh, with China or North Korea, uh, electromagnetic pulse by nuclear weapons set off in the atmosphere would also take out the uh, electrical grid. It would have a tendency to take out a, a lot of other electronic uh, devices as well, including most modern automobiles. Can you imagine the chaos that would erupt in this country if we're suddenly facing weeks, months, or longer without electrical power, without running water in your house because the, the water is moved through the pipeline by electric pumps, uh, without your cell phones working, uh, without your car, if you've got a, if you've got a car that you know, is, is after 1976, it relies heavily on, on computers and, and, and electronics. 
And um, if it is in the area of an electromagnetic pulse, it would cease to work. You'd have chaos here. It would be difficult for the United States military to concern itself with something happening in the Middle East, even with a close ally like Israel, if they're dealing with chaos at home. Not to mention our military relies heavily on electronics to function. So these are some ideas. Uh, another good possibility, and you can see this trend taking place within the United States and within the government of the United States is more and more anti-Semitism. There is more and more push to separatize and even sanction the nation of Israel simply for them trying to uh, continue to exist and defend itself. Of course, anti-Semitism, the hatred for the Jews, is nothing more than, than the, the work of Satan anyway. Anybody that God loves, Satan hates. So when God loved the Jews, Satan hates the Jews. When God loves you and I as human beings, Satan hates humanity. He attacked humanity early on, right there in the Garden of Eden. Satan hates people that come to Christ. That's, that's his ultimate enemy. Because now he's, he's lost the ability to claim their souls, but he still wants to, to hurt that relationship they have with God, uh, make them ineffective for God. He hates you and he attacks you. So anti-Semitism is nothing more than the work of Satan. Nonetheless, the, these nations question it. Now, these, this army, the, the Lord says it's like a cloud on the land. There's no confederacy that's ever been as great as what is being described here. Comes against the nation of Israel. And the Lord says, you can see my anger in my face. My fury will show on my face. You know, imagine whenever you've seen somebody that just was so angry and the veins throbbing and the face turning red. I swear my... The what times I've seen uh, my father get angry, his eyes would actually change colors. And it was scary. And, and I listened then when I saw that. But uh, that's what God is saying. You're going to be able to, to, to know it. There's going to be no doubt in your mind, I'm angry. I'm going to be so angry, I can't hide it. And I am going to act against these nations that are coming against my people Israel. Now, some people uh, have read this description and said, well, you know, Israel may very well uh, defend itself. Uh, if, if no one comes to its aid, it has the ability to defend itself. Uh, it has uh, nuclear capabilities. Uh, perhaps Israel defends itself. And Israel does have the doctrine. Uh, it's called the Samson Doctrine, that if they are about to be overrun, their enemies are about to win. They're, they're about to cease to exist. They're going to make certain their enemies cease to exist too. And which means launching everything they've got. However, when you read through this passage, remember what I told you last week. Pay attention to words and statements that repeat. Over and over and over, he, the Lord says, then they're going to know that I am the Lord. I am going to magnify myself. I am going to glorify myself. All the nations will know that I am the God of Israel. And he especially talks about uh, Israel recognizing that God is their God, that he is their Lord, that he is their protector and defender and the one that they should worship as, as they've been told to do since you know, all the way back in the, in, in the book of Exodus. Um, so what is going to take event here while you could uh, ascribe uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, to this event? Uh, this is going to be a direct action of God against the invaders. Lord, And the Lord uses a perfect battle strategy here. The first thing that he sends is massive earthquake. 
Earthquake so massive that they say it's being felt all around the world. Mountains are falling down. Reading some of the later descriptions where it talks about great hailstones raining down on the army, fire and brimstone, brimstone is sulfur. These are things that are ejected often by volcanoes. Now, he may send this from heaven, or it could be that these earthquakes uh, take place alongside with volcanic activity. But nonetheless, it stops this army in its tracks and causes massive casualties. So massive that he says, you know, I'm going to start bringing the animals to feed on the people that have fallen. But in this battle strategy, not only is he causing massive casualties, not only is he stopping their advance, but when you have uh, an earthquake, uh, particularly if, it, if it's going on with volcanic activity of this magnitude, you're now seeing things like uh, uh, roads being damaged. Uh, you're now seeing things like uh, communication lines being damaged. Uh, you can't even have electromagnetic pulses with a volcano. Uh, so who knows what kind of disruptions are taking place to their communications. They're already in a little bit of a, a, a unique situation because you've got such a confederacy of armies that you've got uh, um, different languages involved. Now you're having disruption of those normal communications and the Lord says, I will bring a sword against them and every man's sword will be against his brother. In other words, these armies that are coming against Israel are going to start to fight each other. Now this could be the confusion of battle, uh, made worse by the Lord disrupting communication lines. Uh, it could be that when this happens, uh, these nations begin to think that uh, perhaps they've been double-crossed, uh, and they begin to blame one another, blame Russia, hey, you brought us to a slaughter. Uh, Whatever the reasoning behind it, they begin to kill each other. Of course, with the killing, uh, with the, the people laying there, not being able to receive medical treatment, or being transported away from the battlefields, is, uh, in addition to being uh, fed on by animals, creates the perfect petri dish for the growth of disease. The Lord says he's going to bring pestilence. Uh, we can interpret pestilence as being disease. Disease is now breaking out, which is further causing pro problems for this massive army. Uh, it, it, it's causing uh, uh, problems in the loss of manpower. Every time a, a man goes down in the, mil in the military, if, he, if he's wounded but not dead, you know, you're looking at uh, at least four people to take care of this guy. So it's creating massive logistical issues. Uh, and, and making this situation even worse, then the Lord says he's also going to send rain down from heaven so as to create massive flooding. Well, you've got standing water, disease flourishes, you've got roads washed out, you know, these main battle tanks, you, you probably heard about them in the news, Ukraine warning uh, Germany's Leopard 2, uh, the United States saying, well, you know, we, we've got to be right there alongside of, of Germany, uh, if they're going to send their main battle tank, we're going to send ours, which is patterned much after that same tank. But you're talking about, as good as these vehicles are, something that weighs 65 to 75 tons. And now they're in this area that's being flooded. Well, you know, they're only as good as much as they can maneuver, right? So, you know, they can be fixed artillery pieces now, but... Who are they going to shoot at? Each other. So it, the Lord in, employs the perfect battle strategy to stop this army. And, and the destruction that he is going to rain down on them is so great that he completely destroys them. They're all wiped out by the, by the Lord's uh, defense of Israel. And it said, he said, I'm magnifying my name in the eyes of many nations. Uh, he says it in verse 6 of uh, chapter 39. 
uh, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, as he talks about how he's, he's destroying this army and, and bringing the, the, the animals and the birds to feast on them. Going on into this, uh, he says that the destruction of this army is so great that the birds and the animals feast on them and he says it will take seven months of people employed full time to bury all the dead. Seven months of full time work to bury you have a question? No, ma'am. This is an attack which we very well may see in our lifetime. Everything is lining up right now to make this happen. But this is not the Battle of Armageddon. These are uh, what they call the, 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 the armies of the north. Okay? Uh, in the Battle of Armageddon, you have the kings of the east who come and they form a confederacy involving all nations of the world that, that remain at this time and all the nations of the world turn on Israel in the battle of, where we get the name Armageddon it, it, it comes from the name of that valley that they're going to come down through um, and in that case when the Lord makes his appearance in the clouds Satan and the Antichrist is going to turn the armies of the earth to wage war against the Lord himself, which of course is utter foolishness. But that's, that's the battle that we think of as Armageddon. This one is going to happen very likely in our lifetime. Are we talking about Palestine? Palestine? Not yet. Well, uh, in what region? What, or where they're invading Israel? Yeah. Yeah, uh, this, this is an invasion of Israel. The other one starts as an invasion of Israel as well. But uh, this, is a, this is an invasion of Israel. And the, in this case, they are coming for wealth and resources. Um, but the Lord says he is going to make the destruction so great that he completely destroys them. There's no question about what's been done. Uh, and it's going to take seven months to, to bury all the bodies. Uh, the, the valley is actually going to become an, an obstruction to travelers to come from the east into Israel. We're going to have to go around, and it's going to be renamed the Valley of the Multitude of God. This is where we bury the multitude of God. But looking again at verse 6 in chapter 39, uh, the Lord says, not only is he going to stop this army that's coming, he says, and I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security of the coastlands. So the Lord is actually going to punish the very nations that this massive army comes from. Those people that are you know, behind the lines, they've stayed home, they're watching it on the news. Uh, he's actually going to cause punishment there. Now, I don't know if it will be uh, complete and total destruction uh, of those nations altogether. Uh, it, may, it may be in, in, in proportion to their wickedness, uh, but it, it could be simply that he destroys their ability to wage war again. Uh, you know, taking out infrastructure, communications, uh, in the case of Russia, taking out their nuclear silos, uh, radar stations, military bases. So the destruction could range from a tactical destruction of their ability to make war again to absolute destruction of the nation. So Magog is Russia? Magog, uh, in, in, uh, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, all of these people populated what we know as Russia now. Uh, but they, they also... You see there, these people populated some of uh, the Eastern European countries. Some of these people actually helped populate Ukraine uh, and all that coastland to the north of the Black Sea. 
uh, and some of these people helped to also uh, populate uh, like Turkey. Uh, Turkey will be one of those nations coming, uh, along with uh, Iran, uh, Sudan, Libya, the, all these nations are, are, are coming against Israel. Now, what is the significance of this? Well, the Lord's already told us over and over and over, it's so that people will know that He is the Lord. This is especially important to the nation of Israel. Now this event is going to take place prior to the tribulation. As I told you about last week, somewhere around the time of the rapture, this event will take place. Uh, could be preceding it, could be immediately at that time, could be shortly thereafter. Uh, but somewhere around that time period, this event takes place. When exactly is not so much important as what it uh, causes. You see, if this, when this, excuse me, uh, takes place and you've got these nations that are taken out, the great empire of, of Russia, uh, the hardcore uh, Islamic nation of Iran, other Islamic nations taken out, Europe becomes, once again, more central to the world. They've kind of, the, 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 the central focus of the world has shifted throughout history. You know, one time it, it was this portion of the world, and then it became Europe. And then the United States became more the, the center of the world, and we see it shifting back now. Well, when you take these nations out, Europe becomes more the center of what's going on in the world. Remember, and we will study this in more detail going forward, but Daniel told us that Antichrist would rise out of a revived Roman Empire. Well, what are we talking about when we're talking about the Roman Empire? You know, we think about them conquering parts of the world uh, like like Israel being under their control and these other parts. But much of the Roman Empire was actually spread from, from Italy up into Europe. So in order for the Antichrist, the Roman Empire to be revived, you have, the world has to become more Eurocentric. Removing these nations makes that happen. It also removes nations that would be in opposition to someone rising up to become the leader of the entire world. It creates uh, or it contributes to the perfect storm which we already see being created uh, for the Antichrist to rise to power. See, people are not going to get behind these guys just because he says, hey, I'm the Antichrist and I'm here to rule. You know, he's got to do something that people wants. He's going to come in. He is going to fix problems. He's going to come up with solutions to issues. And he is going to make a peace treaty with Israel and the nations of the world. Understand the tribulation will not begin immediately after the rapture. There will be a time period as these things are starting to happen. We see the foundation being laid right now with with the world being more and more concerned with uh, pandemics, how are we looking on time up? Okay, let me wrap this part up really quick. We see the we see the foundation being laid. Uh, we've got you know food crisis on the horizon, water crisis on the horizon, wars, rumors of wars. Oh, I think Jesus said something about that. Uh, all this foundation is being laid when there's all these problems. We've got economic nations on the uh, uh, verge of, of collapse. The United States, for all intents and purposes, has collapsed economically. Oh, we still look good because we're still, you know, got money in our pockets and, and the lights are still on, but we are bankrupt. The United States cannot pay the debt it owes now. It's up against this debt ceiling and it's being challenged 
by nations like China that hold a lot of the debt. China's got its own economic problems. Europe's got economic problems. All these things then amplified by this event right here where you've got nations that have ceased to exist. Perfect place for somebody to come in and, and start to solve problems. Somebody that's charismatic. I think this person's probably alive and well today. He's probably rising up through the ranks. Some junior politician somewhere or some billionaire philanthropist uh, that's looking to, to, you know, to be involved in solving different issues in the world. But when all these things come together, now the stage is laid for somebody to come in and solve problems in the world and say, hey, we should make this guy our leader. You know, he's, he's got all these answers and solutions and, and, and he's, he's making all these peace treaties. And, and the peace treaty that he makes with, uh, with Israel, and we'll go into this in depth as we move forward also, is what actually kicks off the tribulation. But I want you to notice, too, that they, they burn the weapons for seven years. Okay, now if the people of Israel are going out and burning the weapons, they have to be done by the middle point of the tribulation. Okay? Because the Antichrist comes in, makes peace, everything's great for three and a half years of the tribulation, but then he declares himself to be God, sets him on a throne in Jerusalem, defiles the temple, and the people flee Jerusalem. Okay? Which would shut down any work that they're now doing to burn weapons and bury the dead. So this event, therefore, has to happen before the tribulation, and if it happens three and a half years before the beginning of the tribulation or more, that's perfect timing to put it around the rapture and what I believe would be in our uh, lifetime. Do we have any quick uh, questions? On this regard, do you think I need to go into a little more detail in our last few minutes? Did you call it war again? Why? We can see. This is going to be. Uh, valley, uh, they're going to bury them in the, uh, a valley to the east yeah. uh, of, of Israel, and the name of it is going to become Hamon God, which really means the multitude, Hoth, the. Mon, multitude, the multitude of God. In other words, that prince and the, all those nations he brought together, <clears throat> this is where they are now. This, this is the bulk of it. And you think that's the Roman Empire in our lifetime? No, that will be, that will be Russia and uh, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Turkey, uh, some other Eastern European nations uh, because uh, Gomer is a Germanic is the father of Germanic tribes, uh, and uh, they'll bring some other, um, possibly Ukrainians with them, since many of these peoples populated Ukraine, um, and other Eastern European nations. A lot of the stands are coming, you know, the Kyrgyz stands, the, the Kazakh stands, uh, peoples from, from Afghanistan uh, coming against these people. Uh -huh. I'm trying to get my questions right by I mean I say God is a God of people, right? This is a people. This yep. is not a God. No, these are not gods. Uh God But they worship something besides our God, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, if you worship any, anything or any person outside of the one true God, it ultimately leads back to Satan. It's, I want to ask a No, uh, there is, yeah, there's one 
true God. Uh, now, he has a chief adversary, Satan, but Satan was an angel that he made. So Satan is not all powerful. He's not all knowing. He's not all present. He is not a God. But mankind tries to create gods, which we put a little g in front of, to worship instead of the one true God. They'll, they'll pick nature. They'll pick a person. They'll pick a an idol that, yeah. you know. Okay, so we don't have anything to worry about while we lose God. No, there, there's, it's not like the Greeks or the Romans oh. where you've got this multitude of gods of different powers. No, there is one true God, and He is sovereign over all. And then it doesn't matter what you want to try and worship and call a God. Besides Him, He's sovereign. All right, let's, uh, let's go upstairs.